Hey, Emily. Hey, Stephanie. You uh, want to do a podcast? Absolutely. Welcome to Cycle Chats, a podcast to destigmatize what it means to be a woman. This is episode 13, Body Image Transformation, with a woman who helps you make peace with your body, gain confidence, thrive, and most importantly, doesn't believe in diets. Deb, welcome to the podcast, Deb. Hi, thank you for having me. So good to be here. I'm so excited to have you. This is really fun. You're our first body image coach. And I think that's a huge issue that women face. How did you get into this field? Yeah, I get to ask that question a lot by, you know, potential clients as well, which is interesting. I think, oh, we have to look back at all the way to childhood, really. And here's a little bit of a trigger wording about eating disorders is somebody needs to know. So I was about six years old and I was just like a normally like healthy, slightly chubby child, super happy kid. I grew up in a really loving family and just was felt I was really looked after and I knew I was loved and then when I went to primary school in Switzerland and you have to bear in mind that in Switzerland there's a lot of stigma around weight people are fairly small bodied and me being from the Italian part even more so like thinness is very much celebrated so just to give you that context so I grew up in an Italian culture and at six years old I remember just going to school one day and all of a sudden I one of these boys in my class started to tease me about my weight and calling me really derogative names and I just remember being really confused because I didn't know there was anything wrong with my body. I just came to school and was made to feel that my body wasn't acceptable the way it was and I remember being very, very confused and didn't really know what to do and long story short that went on for years and years and years we're talking about six to seven years until I was in, in middle school and I remember you know when I was six years old I was going home and that's where I started sort of binge eating on a side because obviously as a kid I didn't know how to cope with the pain and so I found a lot of comfort in food and I remember just stacking up stuff from the kitchen that my mom would hide because like she believed that we had to have there was a lot of labeling like good and bad foods because she wanted us to have things that were nourishing as opposed to like what she considered junk food quote unquote and I remember stacking up and just eating them in secret in my bedroom and then hiding the papers away and I remember feeling a lot of shame around it but I just didn't know that what I was doing was not wrong but it was just like a coping mechanism essentially but I remember food being a comfort for me at the time and I think that's where everything started and my body just started to really decline and I was made to feel wrong for what I looked like and then later down the line I think as a teenager without knowing I developed an eating disorder which turned out to be diagnosed as bulimia when I was 23 so it took me ages to actually get help and I remember getting help because at some point I just it was a dark period I was struggling I was in an emotional abusive relationship and I was really struggling with food and I was obsessed about food. I just kept dieting every diet you can possibly imagine. I started dieting at 13 years old and I was quite sneaky about it as well. And I was always constantly obsessed about food, thinking about calories, counting it, fitness pal, like every single tracking device I had. And it's just like an obsession, really, really not good. And I started going to the gym as well really early on. I was like 16. I always been really active. But at that point, I knew looking back that I was going because I wanted to burn up calories, not just because I liked it. And when I was 23, I remember coming home and just sitting on the sofa and just crying so hard and just thinking to myself, I cannot live one more day. Like I, I can't hating myself, just crying from the mirror, disgusted. I cried so much. And then I thought, okay, this has to be another way, right? That to me, because I lived like this for in my entire life, hating my body. I didn't know there was an alternative. That's the thing. I didn't know. And the body positive movement was at the very kind of like started taking a mainstream around that time, more or less, especially on Instagram, which is where I was hanging on. And then I found this book, which is called Body Positive Power by Megan Jane Crabb. And I was like, okay, let me give it a go. I opened it. I read it through quite quickly. I closed it. I was like, this is just somebody excusing obesity and unhealthy behaviors. Because remember at the time I was so ingrained in diet culture and I was so fed up with all this misunderstanding about health and body fat, etc., and body image that I just thought that was bullshit. And then some time passed. I asked for help. I went to a therapist. And the first thing I was told is you need to stop dieting. And I freaked out. Like I freaked out because I didn't know. To me, diet 
everything was being in control. It meant that I was in control of myself, of my body, which is really not true, but it felt like that at the time. So I picked a book back up and I read it again with like a more open mind. And I thought, you know what? Okay, living the way that I've lived so far didn't help. It made me just miserable. So how about I try something different? I tried to actually get out of dieting and really understand that diet culture made me who I am and made me hate my body just in order to sell me products that would benefit them. So I went down that route and I was like, hey, let's give it a go. What I've done so far didn't work. Let's try something else. And I stayed in therapy for a long time. Like I think three years. I'm still working on it because currently I'm 27 now. So it's been four years. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to unpack and undo. So yeah, I basically ended up working with a dietitian as well who does intuitive eating. So I kind of had to learn how to eat again from like almost from scratch because I didn't know. I didn't have hunger cues and fullness cues anymore. I was just, food to me was calories. It was obsession. So I had to relearn how to eat and I had to really start reframing my relationship with exercise as well. And on top of that, I was in fashion school. So not the greatest <laughs> environment to be in when you're struggling with, you know, body image disorders. I was also diagnosed not just with bulimia, but with body dysmorphic disorders and binge eating disorder on top of everything else so being in that industry and just photographing models that were very skinny and just being around this obsession around thinness wasn't healthy and then when I graduated at 24 I went to work for a theater for a couple of years and then I got really lost throughout my years at university I was doing a lot of work artistic work that always had elements of feminism sort of like female empowerment a lot of movement and sports and positive psychology as well as like body image issues but I didn't really realize that at the time I didn't connect the dots and then all this work was really important in what I was doing and then I went on to work for the theater two years and it was okay but I felt really lost after two years and I decided that I wanted to quit my job I didn't know what else to do though I just thought I don't want to work in this industry anymore and then I was having a conversation with a friend that I was saying I feel really lost I don't know what I want to do and I said have you ever thought about coaching and then I said because I feel like you really help people in general like you're really good at listening and kind of guiding people so it sounds like that could be something good for you and so I went home and I researched what coaching is and what type of coaching there are and it's just like you know when the light bulb just goes up in your head and I was like oh my god this is it like oh my god yes and within two hours I call my parents I call my friends I'll be like this is what I want to do I know this is the right thing and for the first time I felt like yes this is it this is right this is for me I know that and so I basically signed up for the coaching diploma which I obtained like last year and it was such an amazing experience and I loved it so much because it's very much like forward oriented and it's very clean center it looks at a kind of very positive way like they have all the resources that they need within themselves already and I thought that's so empowering I love that and then it's just as I graduated from it I started thinking okay well what niche do I want to work with and in the back of my mind it was a little voice being like body image body image and I was like nope because <laughs> I was I just thought I'm a fraud because I'm still working on it so who am I to teach women how to accept their bodies but the truth is that I think I was scared I was really terrified that I was going to be triggered and they would send me down a spiral hearing diet talk from other women would send me back down a spiral but then that'd be completely opposite because now I see these women I'm like I would never go back there ever like if anything he sent me running down the opposite direction and it made me grow so much working with these amazing women and I think it really lit a fire in me and I think everything once I decided not to be true to myself and do that work and walk my talk fully everything clicked all the pieces of the puzzle came together I just found my way I think so that's how it came to me it's like I know it's a really long story but it was an evolution of things I think it was it was a long process to get where I am now and now to my practice so I'm studying personal training at the moment and nutrition as well because I want to add those two to the practice with like a hey so health of every size and intuitive eating approach to continue this journey essentially what you said it hits a lot of points and I didn't grow up with body image based on weight but I grew up with body image based on hair and nose issues you know just being different looking physically that was a huge thing for me growing up and it's still something that I'm learning to love about myself I love that you're still on this journey and you're able to coach people through their own journey because that's kind of what Stephanie and I do. That's what this podcast is. We would be lying if we were like, we're perfect and everything is fine all the time because that's not how it is. And people are always learning. So I admire that about you. I think it's a huge strength that you're able to, while still be on your journey to help others with theirs. And we talk about this a lot too, is that women helping other women. I don't think perfection exists. I have women who tell me they beg to differ. No, perfect is 
real and you have to strive for it. And there's something to be said about when you're still going through a journey and then you're helping somebody else start theirs. You have the experience and the backing to help them, but the comfort level of, hey, you're not alone. I'm just a little bit further on this path than you are, but come join me and keep coming to join me. And we're eventually going to get to that part together. And I think that feeling of, oh, I'm a fraud. I get that. I cannot tell you how many times I get that. And I have to remind myself, I'm like, no. And like, when we talk to women like you and like some of the lovely other ladies we've had on this podcast, it's a constant reminder of somebody might just be a little bit further on that journey, but let them help you start yours so that you guys can meet up together. Literally. Oh, I got goosebumps right now. Just listening to this because it very much like exactly what I'm saying. And I thought at the beginning of my journey, I thought this was a wrong thing. You no, know, I thought I have to all, all figure it out because otherwise they're going to find out that I can't really help them. But the truth is that working with my clients, I just call them my girls. I feel like we're a team because I am learning so much from them because it's interesting what you said about the fact that for you, for example, is a nose as opposed to like weight, you know? And that also told me that I was very much focused about weight initially, but now I'm looking at it on a broader spectrum as well. And I think that's interesting. That's something that I've been learning. And in general, sometimes I feel like I have a Facebook group for it as well, which is growing really fast. And sometimes I do mistakes there as well. I was terrified when I opened the group because I'm sure you notice in the internet, as soon as you say something wrong, you get really strongly attacked. And so I was thinking, oh my God, what if I say the wrong thing? And I think it's correct to call people out, but at the same time, depends how you do it. I very strongly believe in compassion and kindness when you are educating somebody. And so I was terrified of saying the wrong thing that maybe came out as fat phobic for whatever reason or insulting to somebody. But then I tried to really not, not let it stop me from doing the work and thought, okay, you know, if somebody calls me out, that's fine. That it's a good opportunity for a discussion and to learn. I completely get that. You see that a lot more where people are so, and again, this gets a bad rap, this word when you're like PC police, but some people get so overly aggressive. It's not necessary. Hey, I don't think you understand what that means. Let's talk about it. Maybe do a little more research instead of immediately pointing the finger and being like, you're this name, you're this, you're this, you're that. You're immediately going on the attack for something you don't understand. Talk to each other, communicate. Exactly. And I think to me, that's really important because I've been noticing when it comes to fat phobia, reasons, and all types like feminism, people attacking each other. And I understand that people might be tired of saying the thing, same thing over and over again. I understand that. But also when you attack someone, your message doesn't necessarily come across. And that's my opinion. That's just not how I function. There is a very fine line between policing and canceling and allowing discussion. And it's a very difficult in this community because there's a lot of trigger warning, which I think sometimes can tend to be almost like censoring and then doesn't leave room for discussion and I understand that I have duty of care towards these people in this community but at the same time there's a fine line between censoring again and letting something be in order to generate a discussion if that makes sense. You said trigger wording that is very interesting to me because for me I have always felt that when I feel triggered by something I make note and I say this is obviously something I need to address and work on. For me it's the red light to say, why am I feeling like this over this? That don't ask, don't tell thing. That's not good because then you're shutting yourself off from really deeply healing some wounds that might be a little bit scary to acknowledge. And we all have them no matter how big, how small. I completely agree. And that's why handling these communities can be very difficult because there's people who come from histories of eating disorders and might see something about somebody talking about weight and that can be very triggering to them. But then when do I remove a comment about that? When do I live it in order to allow for a discussion to happen and for this person to perhaps you know have a talk with themselves and then I can talk to them about this you know because it can be healing so I think that's that's the problem in the internet that I'm seeing right now that's so much is being censored I agree with protecting people and I think a trigger warning is fair because then you can decide whether you want to read about it or not but then canceling and censoring I don't know I don't know I have an interesting thought about that as well basically aligning with yours because I honestly think that if we don't hear somebody else out, if we don't hear somebody else's opinion, don't understand somebody else's story and immediately cut them off, then we're not doing our part of learning. We need to be willing to be uncomfortable. But also too, people think change. Oh, I'm not going to change myself. Nobody's asking you to change who you are. They're asking you to shift your ways and your shift your thought process. Change is not bad. Just like we talk about selfishness a lot. Like it's okay to be selfish. Most of the time women will look at these words and that we avoid them 
done, and then we do avoidance behaviors, those words need to start having a positive connotation. We are all living in the same planet. We're just having different experiences. That's the truth. And I think we forget that very quickly is that we other each other so easily. It's acceptance and it's learning to switch that thought process. And I, I think that does play into very much play into what you do for a living because think about it, body image, who's suffered the most? Who gets it choked down their throats? I mean, beauty industry standards are so ridiculous. And since day one, since I've been in them, I had my own struggles. Makeup for me was never something fun. It started turning into a crutch for me to feel better about myself. And that was wrong. And it led to so many bad things. And I had to reclaim it and make it something good and beautiful. When a client sits in my chair, especially a woman who's feeling vulnerable, and they're like, oh my God, fix this. I said, there's nothing for me to fix. Only enhance the beauty that's already there. They're like, oh, well, you're so gorgeous. I said, all of this comes off if I'm really made up. I said, all this comes off. We're still, we are still made of the same stardust. We're the same. It plays into that because women just get pummeled with, you have to look like this, but it's never looked like this for you. Oh no, it's always for the pleasure of somebody else. But I, I like what you said, because in the fashion industry, very like exactly goes hand in hand with the beauty industry. You're taught to have to look a certain way and have to behave a certain way and, you know, kind of fake it on social media to just look cool, way cooler than you actually are. So what do you find, Deb, that your clients, what is the number one complaint that your clients have about their bodies? Is it one consistent thing for each woman that you find? I had to think about this because the truth is that no, the quick answer is that no, there is no one single thing. And the reason why is because again, we're groomed to hate every bit of ourselves, like from our thighs, like there's enough find our nails are not fine, our hair, like everything. So every single woman has a different complaint about their bodies. Sure, there are more consistent ones that seem to be, from what I understand, the belly and the sort of like the thighs seems to be some of the biggest like concerns, generally speaking, especially like in larger women. But I think it's not really a complaint. It's just something that I noticed that they struggled the most with and that being comparison. So I really looked into comparison a lot and it's a thing that I get asked all the time. So how do I not compare myself to others? I wish I had a simple answer to that because sometimes I think women hope that there is a simple answer where the truth is that the reason. So I always like to explain where comparison comes from. If you think about it, it comes like from way, 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 way back when we still had like tribes, you know, there were nomadic tribes and women compared to each other because they needed to be able to fit in to the group because otherwise being outcasted to them meant death, essentially. So we are wired to compare each other for a reason. And that obviously is no longer applies in most, you know, most of the world doesn't apply anymore. And yeah, we still do that because we are now being groomed to compete for the attention of men and to kind of get on top and that's interesting you know if you think about it I don't think a baby is born comparing they don't care they are taught to compare themselves look at that girl look how prettier hair is why isn't yours like that and then you want to elevate yourself by getting the same hair etc or by the industry to sell us products to attain that standard of beauty so I think comparison is one of the most devastating things for women when it comes to their self-esteem and body image it's really really bad and I think most of the time we do it unconsciously we don't even realize we're doing that especially when you're just i don't know if, if it ever happened to you guys but i do notice myself sometimes scrolling on instagram and without even thinking about it, i unconsciously go oh she looks really nice i should look more like that or oh she's working out today ah, i didn't do a workout today things like that it's a constant thing and that's why there is no simple way to say oh fix it by doing this and that i think it requires a lot of self-awareness and just the willingness also to let go because comparison can feel really comfortable we're so used to it right it's just it's just the thing that you do and so stepping away from it a lot of women say well if i don't compare myself that's a source of motivation for them to quote unquote um, improve themselves if i don't do it i'm gonna become a couch potato i'm like okay so let's let's look at that is that true Are are you really going to become a couch potato if you don't compare yourself? Can we find other sources of motivations that actually are healthy and helpful to you? And also another thing that I think they worry about is looking obviously a certain way and you know meeting society standards. But the truth is that if we all ate the same, the same things, the exact same things, same quantity, etc., and worked out the same, we still all look completely different. And that's something that we forget all the time because we're showed one standard of beauty to aspire to. But the truth is that if you 
you walk on the street, you're going to see such a variety of people. And it's so easy to forget when all you see in the media is the same thing over and over again. Comparison is huge. And I wish we could snap our fingers like Thanos and the Avengers and just like fix that issue. But like you said, if we all ate the same, worked out the same, there would still be differences. You're always going to find something to compare. And it's just so, and I did it for forever because as a woman, like you said, it's just kind of, we just do it. It's it's natural. That's but, the thing, it's natural. That is a problem yeah. right there, that we don't yeah. even notice that we're doing that. Sometimes, like, sorry to interrupt, it, was just, it just came to mind as something, an example, because again, I always like to say to my clients and the women I talk to that I still do that. that I don't want to think I'm free of comparison because I'm really f- very far from it. And one of the biggest environments for me where comparison is gym, because I love, love, love working out. I have a good relationship with fitness now. But when I'm in the gym, if I'm having like what I call like a bad body day, oh my God, I, I have this great workout, but then I live the gym feeling quite miserable. And then I have to really think about what happened. And I was like, oh, I like spend the past one and a half hours comparing myself to every single girl in the gym. Without not to say, I do it on an auto palette. And now I've, because of therapy has been really helping me to become more aware of it and stop it before it goes down a spiral. But this just goes to show that we sometimes are so unable to be present that our brains just take a whole like life of their own and just go down a tangent. That can be so damaging though. What's your age range that you coach? And then what age do you find is more susceptible to an eating disorder? So I don't work with anybody under the age of 18 because I think that should be personally, I think that should be a job of a therapist. And I don't work with women who have active eating disorders because again, that's not, that's a job for a therapist or a psychologist. So for me to be able to work with somebody, they have to have either recovered or kind of have maybe disorder eating. That's okay. But eating disorder, I wouldn't be able to work with them. I know there's coaches out there that do it. Unfortunately, I think it's very unethical. But to answer your question, I think interestingly, most of the people that I coach are from 25 onward. So my oldest client at the moment is 45 and my youngest is 25. It was really interesting because at the beginning when I was kind of, you know, niching down and thinking about who I wanted to work with, I assumed that it would be younger women. So we're talking 20 to like 30. And the truth is that I think a lot of women at that time, from my experience in talking to women, they're just not ready yet. They might still be so much into that culture that they don't even think that living in a different way is possible. And maybe I'm wrong, but it is just what I gathered so far by doing this work. And what I realized as well is that sometimes like people don't start doing the work because they're still so obsessed with their relationship with food that working on their confidence and their self-acceptance just feels so far removed that it isn't even a possibility. I think that there's a lot of growing that goes on between that five-year age gap between 20 and 25. Like that was huge for me. Huge. I thought I was going to get married at, you know, I had a boyfriend at that time. It was really serious. I was like, oh, we're going to get married and I'm 21 and I know exactly what I want in my life. I did not know. I I was a totally different person. I was still really growing and I, I still am. It was just, it, it really, it's so different. And I by no means am trying to be ageist when I say the things that I say about younger gals, but I just like, I was the same as Emily at 1924. I was with somebody in college. Those are such informative years. And I felt like with those years, I gained a lot, but I also lost a lot. But then we talk about this on the podcast, right? We think, were we ready for those things then? I wasn't ready to be alone, to do the work, to figure out what it is that I wanted. It's again, you always have to learn some sort of a lesson, I think, from everything that you do. I see now, I'm like, I'm not going to speak to some 19-year-old girl and change her mind on what it is that she wants to do. But maybe I will inspire her to make a little bit of a switch in a certain part of her life. And that's the goal. That's it. I just want you to have food for thought. I'm not trying to change your mind. You are still going to make your mistakes, quote unquote. You're still going to go through life making your own decisions that you feel in your mindset you want to make. And then, you know, you might even say, gosh, I wish I would have done this different, but I remember the piece of advice this person gave me who was older. It's never about like, I need you to switch your thinking and get on my team. I just want you to think about what you're doing a little bit before you do it. And if you still feel it's something you want to do, then that's your choice. That's the freedom that you are born with. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. For sure. No, I completely agree with you. And that's why I think it's interesting that most of the women that come to me are from 25 onward. Because if I think about it, the moment that I was ready to admit that my way of living wasn't sustainable and that was a clear, very, very big issue was 24. How do you help create a healthy relationship with food, with your clients? What's something that you really focus in on helping them first with before you get into any more deeper things? 
it's such a complex topic that for example like what I do I don't want to sell like self-promotion but like my program for example is, is four months long and the first month is just mindset we're not even talking about body image we're not talking about anything it's just mindset because we're looking at packing all of your thoughts becoming more aware of what's going on in your mind and that's a big thing mindset is huge and looking at your thoughts and really understanding them so I think that the number one thing is like unpacking all the harmful beliefs that we have built up about our bodies during a lifetime because we're looking at a lifetime of like grooming like you said exactly and I think we are all running narratives in our minds that can be very harmful and we need to first spot them because we often run on autopilot and then we need to spot them to be able to start changing them so awareness and unpacking those beliefs is the first thing and second is to understand that our bodies like their shape weight like age size ability race gender like and health status do not dictate our worthiness because we have been told that by diet culture that if we are thin white able-bodied and skinny then we are worthy if not then you are less worthy if not completely unworthy so that's something that holds a lot of power over women uh, there is an exercise that i get my clients to do to look at their biases and beliefs about fat and thin which are words that are so loaded but really are just adjectives are they neutral in my opinion when i say a person is fat it's not derogative it's simply like that's it like a thin and fat they hold no way no meaning that's it they're just descriptors and i think we need to be able to do that and this is to show like when what does it mean what uh, the exercise like what comes to mind when i say the word fat and most likely it's going to be you know embarrassing unhealthy unworthy or less worthy very kind of sad and when you say thin successful worthy beautiful etc so you can see there's so many biases that we need to start undoing which is interesting and then another thing is to again this comparison what we said before about really understanding that no matter if we ate all the same we worked out all the same we dress all the same we still look different and then reconnecting with our bodies and I think that ties in more with food and exercise as well and just being able to kind of nourish our bodies in a way that feels good to us because we're all different we all function in different ways and that's important to understand and that also moving in a way that feels good a lot of people I think hate exercise because they see it as a duty but if that can change I think different types of movement if you find something that you enjoy and you stick with it that's going to be great for you because exercise is so many health benefits so many like from a psychological emotional level to physical level and changing that relationship I think is so 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 important and then honoring ourselves I think honoring our bodies as well is part of changing that relationship because for most of my life I punished my body for what it looked like you know I beat it up I starved it I beat it up in the gym with like grueling workouts which I do enjoy to some level but I remember at the time if I was being honest with myself I was just trying to burn off as many calories as I could and I remember like maybe a year ago I was doing EMDR therapy which is therapy for trauma that had to do with sort of bullying and I just realized then how disconnected I was with my body because to me connecting with my body meant that just realizing that I had to accept myself as I am now and that to me felt like impossible I just thought I'm gonna let myself go what happens if I allow myself to do that and I remember for the first time in my life I kid you not just why are you doing these EMDRs where you have your eyes closed and you're just imagining memories and I felt my my body for the first time it's really hard to explain it sounds a bit crazy but uh, for the first time like my therapist said touch your arm or touch a part of yourself that you're not comfortable with and I'm touching my belly for the first time feeling it and thinking this feels nice and I remember crying so I just burst and I just exploded and went off for crying like for like two days literally like non-stop I was just I opened the faucet and there was no stopping it and I still have to do that work because it was a moment but I it was there that moment was there and so I'm holding on to it because it's possible to get to a place where you just know like your body's amazing it does so much for you it's so amazing but we forget about that and I, I forget about it all the time what does women empowerment mean to you I found that as such a loaded question I think it's about making sure that women understand their self-worth their worthiness and that is the number one thing and then it's about I think uplifting each other and what I talk about this is especially uplifting marginalized people who might not have as much of a voice as a white blonde blue eyed girl like me has so it's just like yeah I think it's just about uplifting every woman but especially those who are for whichever reason marginalized that's even more important and I'm so tired of like you know girls growing up with that we're like the mean girls quote unquote I just never understood that it's just it just 
just baffled me just to think why you would drag other people down other women down because we don't need that we're already <laughs> leaving a society that drag us down so why are we doing that to each other it just baffles me but I remember occasionally making comments about other women's bodies when I was like a bit younger and I'd be like oh she looks so bad in those jeans she shouldn't wear that I used to do that and I went up to it and now I'm like I was so insecure I think I was just projecting and that's all I was doing but I was taking women down and now I don't do that anymore if I need to <laughs> fight with somebody I will call them out on what's wrong what what's wrong in the conversation of like call out what's problematic it has nothing to do with their looks I still go through bouts of that I'm still guilty of looking at another woman and being like oh why is she wearing that what's different now is that I the minute that thought happens I catch myself and I say but what is she doing personally to you by wearing that and then I stop and I go self you are right she is beautiful and she is happy in what she's wearing and that is none of my business. To say you always, I think it's still part of you if it's still in your thought process. But again, learning to switch the way that you think and catch it when it happens. And it doesn't happen often really anymore. I was very insecure when I was younger. So it was just constant. But now if it does happen, I stop myself and I'm like, yeah, but who's she hurting? Like she's not hurting you. You're going to get a laugh from who? Who are you trying to impress with this? Because then I have to think of, I know sometimes how I I dress and how I look. I said, would you like that if someone's doing that to you? And I stop. And immediately I think, you know what though? Her hair is amazing. Or I love that. And I'll try to find a compliment on it. You have to acknowledge, acknowledge bad behavior and then work on changing Grow it. from it. Grow yeah, from it. Grow from it. Yeah. Grow from your mistake. Exactly. I think it's calling ourselves out with compassion. That is, but 100%. I used to be, I think in my head, I never voiced these things, but I, because I was very insecure, I was very uncomfortable in my body. What I realized that often I brought other women down for their bodies but I was actually just projecting if I saw a girl like in a bigger body rocking a skirt I was jealous because me in my privileged thin body I wasn't able to do that I wasn't confident enough and so the natural thing was to bring her down to make myself feel better but actually it doesn't work that way ever since I stopped doing that or try my best to kind of catch myself like you said and reframe so much better and so much better and now I cannot stand when I hear other women just attacking another woman on her looks I like what do her looks say about her as a person please help me I don't understand like it just it doesn't I'm so sorry it doesn't I don't know maybe as a woman I see it differently I don't know I do see things differently because we were treated differently for such a long time we didn't have the same kind of rights and we still are and we're still now I feel like it's the other side of the coin where it's like you know if you're not sexy it doesn't sell it's like oh but be sexy for you but then but don't be too sexy but then you know wear makeup but then don't wear makeup and cut your hair and if you do this it's like you can never win so just find and be yourself I feel that this is an appropriate time for Emily's question she always asks and I want to ask if okay then I'll ask your question we'll just we'll switch it up again we're gonna switch what advice with all of the knowledge and wisdom you have now what advice would you give your 15 year old self yeah I oh, I have a million and a half I have a little bit of a debate over this because I think if I had known that actually no go talk to someone because I've always been a very independent young woman as in I'm a warrior I don't need anybody I can shoulder everything and just which is I think is a great attitude to have in life don't get me wrong until it's not because then it took me until 24 years old of suffering to actually get help but if I maybe had said something before about how uncomfortable I was maybe I would have gotten help before and that's you know as I was six years old normally kids most of the times do go to their parents to tell them they're being bullied I did not I never they didn't know my mom found out maybe four years ago when I talked to her and she was shocked she had no idea what was going on with me she didn't know I had bulimia she didn't know any of that stuff and that's because I just shoulder all by myself and then if I you know if I could go back and tell my 15 year old self be like please talk to someone trust me not everybody is out there to get you because that's I felt like alone against the world but the truth is that I I put myself in that position you in a way by just keeping people at arm's length and not just yeah and just not being honest about what's going on I was really ashamed to be fair I think one of us would be like just talk to someone and trust that there are people out there who are actually genuinely happy to help you first of all that's so much of a strength right just asking for help is is a strength oh my god huge, huge. Uh, you know we don't all know everything we're all not perfect because there is no such thing as perfect so we're all just constantly learning so it's okay to 
hey, I don't understand this. Can you help me out? That is such a beauty and a strength. And Deb, this has been such a delight. I'll ask Steph's question, which is where can people find you and do you have any fun projects coming up? Yeah, of course. So you can find me on Instagram at Deborah Katetti. I don't hang out there too much, but the place where you can most find me is my Facebook group is called Body Image Bullshit detox and it's just you can just join it and it's a growing community of women it's really fun we talk about mainly body image and but also like feminism like racism all sorts of stuff and the women in there are amazing i love them and my fun project well i have a lot i have a lot coming up so i'm just getting a diploma in nutrition and in personal training soon so i'm launching a new program that's basically gonna have to do with body image and adding burlesque into it so i'm collaborating with a burlesque teacher to bring that to life to really kind of boost the confidence so yeah that's kind of like what i'm working on but there is so much in my mind i'm I'm such a creative person and my brain is going i mean the mind is an hour all the time and i feel like i don't have enough hours in the day deb i mean thank you thank you thank you a thousand million times for taking the time to open up and be honest and speak about your truths because you're not alone and there are so many other people that are going to be able to listen to this and know that they're not alone so thank you so much for taking your time for syncing up with us and to everybody listening we hope you sync up with us next time